Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Good morning, everybody. This is Scott Perry speaking, and I'm here with my associate, Drummond Reed. And today we're going to talk about building trust in blockchain, how blockchain will rev revolutionize business in 2020. Uh, say hello to everybody, Drummond. Hello, everybody. I'm glad yeah. to be here. I think this, this is a fascinating topic, and, and uh, Scott's one of the experts in the world on this very particular topic. Well, great. So Drummond and I are hailing from Seattle, Washington in the United States. And obviously, we, we want to talk briefly about, you know, what we're all dealing with as a global crisis. Um, Washington State specifically is a hotbed for the coronavirus. We have a thousand uh, cases that have been uh, identified and we have 50 uh, deaths here. I'm actually 15 miles away from the kind of the origin in the United States of, of, of the virus. And so it is a particularly interesting times that we live in. Um, I did want to share with you that I had my perspective on this particular topic uh, and how uh, this topic may be ad advancing itself because of the coronavirus. Um, you know, blockchain assists in the digital life that we experience, and there's a lot more going on in the world today depending on digital life. Uh, people are working from home. I'm sure all of you are listening in or most of you are probably from home offices, new spaces that you've been in aside from your office workplace. So, uh, you know, I, I hope that this will, this topic will be, will resonate to you, give you some insights on some technology that is, uh, that I've been working on for the last few years. So uh, I'm excited to have all of you join us uh, today. It's actually early morning uh, on the West Coast of the United States, and I'm sure there's different time zones around the world. So, so let's get into it a little bit. Let me first introduce myself and, and my background and why I should be speaking or I'm speaking on this topic. So uh, I have been a career uh, IT auditor and uh, worked for uh, two of the larger firms in the uh, in Seattle area, uh, Deloitte and Ernst Young. I actually was the auditor for uh, Microsoft, the external financial auditor for Microsoft, right around the time of the internet. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how this time at, uh, mirrors, you know, 1996 on the early advent of uh, the internet and controls around that. So uh, 15 years ago, I got very deep into auditing um, PKI technology, public key infrastructure technology, and auditing certification authorities that provide security uh, certific certificates on the internet. And uh, I now have been working with one of the largest in the industry that issues credentials for almost half the internet. And so I've been working uh, around internet security and cyber security for, uh, for my career. And in the last five years, uh, been looking for different applications of cryptography and public key infrastructure that uh, may advance the security on the internet and blockchain has came to my attention uh, almost four years ago and uh, was working with kind of the leading um, authorities and moving forward on certain technology and in the last four years have been an advisory um, person uh, on some global blockchains and working uh, with Drummond on advancing governance on, on blockchain networks. So uh, I'm excited to be here and let me uh, introduce Drummond and let him talk a little bit about his background. Sure. So unlike Scott, I'm not from the um, auditor uh, space it, with two slides ahead, Scott, here. Um, I'm not. 
yeah, I'm not from the um, uh, Otter space, and I didn't actually uh, start in the blockchain space either. I spent the last 20 years in the topic of uh, digital identity, specifically internet identity. Um, there's a workshop on that that I helped start for, uh, yeah, 14 years ago. This will be the 15th year, and I've been to every single one. It happens twice a year. Uh, I've worked on um, uh, a whole, you know, passel of standards related to internet identity at these different uh, W3C and these other organizations that you see on the slide. Um, my day job is uh, uh, interesting. The the R got left off there, Scott. It's Chief Trust Officer at Evernim, um, and then uh, I helped um, one of the founding trustees of an international nonprofit uh, set up to specifically support this new. Uh, type of identity, a, a blockchain for this new type of identity we're going to explain to you, uh, self-sovereign identity, and that's why it's called the Sovereign Foundation. Uh, and there I chair the Governance Framework Working Group, and that's where Scott and I do a lot of our work together in the developments of governance for a specific uh, kind of blockchain and ecosystem that we'll describe to you on this call. Um, a lot of the research, it's important to understand, uh, on the underlying standards for this was actually funded by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Um, the DID, that's Decentralized Identifiers, and Decentralized Key Management Projects were um, funded by them because of their implications for uh, the strengthening our cybersecurity, and we'll, we'll explain exactly why that's the case. Um, the DID specification has since gone to the W3C World Wide Web Consortium, uh, the home of international web standards. And uh, it is now a full, um, uh, what they call working group there. I am the co-editor of that specification. And uh, within about a year, that should now be an international standard for decentralized identifiers. And uh, we'll explain exactly what that standard will mean. Great. So uh, this is the topics we're gonna cover today. Um, we are not going to get into a deep technical conversation around um, blockchain um, components. We're focusing on trust. You know, all of you that have heard blockchain have been closely associated blockchain with digital trust. And the word is, you know, that, you know, the parlance has been bantered around a lot. But uh, we're going to get right into it because, you know, as many of your professionals that are listening to this, you're involved in the trust uh, of, of entities that are out there in the marketplace. You advance standards, ISO standards for some of these folks and keep them account, keep your clients accountable for that. And we're going to talk about, you know, kind of uh, demystifying the process of trust first and identifying, getting down to the roots there. And then Let's, we're going to talk about how blockchain has unique attributes that would advance uh, digital trust. And then we'll talk about, you know, the specific applications that are best uh, for this technology and then talk about kind of the governance process and the stack of trust, the technology stack and tr and uh, uh, data transmission stack that's needed in order to kind of move forward and communicate information uh and using this new technology and hopefully we'll get done with this uh you know at the quarter of the hour and uh have opportunity for some questions so when we start with you know a definition of trust trust is a, a human perception i mean it, it it's it's analog in a digital world it's it's humanities taught to a stem class it, it gets defined best in philosophy and sociology classes, not necessarily computer science. I mean, trust is something that you can see. You can't see it, you can't hear it, you can't taste it, but you know when you lose it. And, and you can, you know, it's a personal thing. And all the people listening here, you understand when you, when someone, you know, you lose trust for someone, you, you can feel it and you understand it. Now, the question is, how do you define it in a context that allows for a collaborative uh, exercise? And so my definition, and I'm going to get back to that at the end of the day, is a predicted uh, level of confidence. And that's more of a statistical basis. And we're going to try to take something that's more theoretical into more of a statistical uh, kind of basis. Any other comments, uh, Drummond, on that? 
All right, let's move on to the next slide. So I, I haven't seen this slide, you know, the depth of this when we talk about trust. And by the way, for all of you folks that are listening in that, uh, the picture is actually of, of Gibraltar. And that's been kind of the sign of trust, you know, and it's kind of interesting as, as kind of we look at that because it's, it seems permanent and, 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 and rock hard. And so when we look at trust, and you know, we look at what are the attributes of trust. And I've done some research on, on this to really, because I'm in the trust fabric uh, of, of internet trust. And so there are various things that we need to evaluate when we consider how trust gets uh, added and you know, to, to transactions and, and daily life. First of all, we need to have context. So, you know, sometimes so we'll we'll trust people to fix them, fix your car, but maybe that person, we won't trust them to give keys to our house, you know? So there's a context associated when we uh, exhibit trust and, and we establish a trust relationship with people and organizations. And so there needs to be a perception of risk within, a pro, with, within any, any kind of trust relationship. So when, you know, there, there's aspects that there will be, you know, challenges or problems when trust fails and there needs to be benefit when trust gets exhibited. There needs to be some calculated vulnerability associated with the lack of trust. And when we, when we create trust, there needs to be a value that we, that's a tangible value that adds, that adds to transactions and adds to the benefit of collaboration and trustworthiness of organizations. Now, in order to establish uh, trust, there needs to be kind of the, 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 uh, the pieces that create trust. So, you know, typically a transaction that would create trust is, I'm going to say something, say what, I, say what I'm gonna do, and then I'm gonna do what I say. And after I say what I'm going to do and do what I say, you know, I have established um, better trust, more confidence. As we go back to my definition, we're going to get confidence that I will continue to do what I'm doing. Now, I need to have demonstrated some competence, a perception of achievability. I mean, I can't say that I'm going to fly to the moon. I have no track record or established reputation, but I have established re reputation to auditing certification authorities and folks can gain a perception of achievability that I can do that. Now, I need to be able to have done that and demonstrated that I was able to do that. That in itself will create trust and we need to have those building blocks associated with it. Philosophers say that you need to have a foundational optimism. You need to believe that things that, that I can trust, that I can, that the there is trust in the world and I can, can achieve it, okay? And at times, you know, our, you know, during economic times, things change with that. But, but th trust thrives better when there is foundational optimism and there's underlying motivation for parties to trust each other, okay? So, you know, as we look and translate trust to digital trust, internet trust. One of the things in my career and working with internet security is the internet is really a mirror of society. And in the mirror of society, humans fail and they have motivations that may be, you know, counterproductive to global uh, productivity. There's, and so, you know, actually, the, the largest percentage of errors on the internet are due to human frailty. And even though systems work, and we're dealing with a, you know, a network of, of computer systems operating uh, transactions, you need to have a system development life cycle because if you make you know, bad changes in, into code and you don't have a, a, a valid and robust system development life cycle, you're going to introduce errors and and uh, modif and in, inappropriate modifications in systems. And there are, you know, frankly, 
there's hardware and network failures. I mean, we're going to be challenging that in the in, in the world today. Is there's more dependence on uh, communication technology, and there always will be bad actors. I mean, I, I don't know if all of you have heard about it, but you know, there's there's sites going up, fake sites going up for the coronavirus that are that are uh, uh, honeypots for fraud, and there'll always be uh, individuals with mean intents trying to take advantage of society at any time in our history. So, you know, obviously we're talking to an audience sponsored by PECB. And um, by the way, I am a PECB uh, um, affiliate. I, I am a ISO 27001 cybersecurity lead auditor uh, and a trainer. And um, you know, worked with ISO on on the standards end as well. But I wanted just for a simple purpose of kind of getting through digital trust. These, as a CPA, uh, I issue SOC reports, and I think you know many of the people in the audience understand what SOC reports are, and they're driven by the the U.S. Uh, accounting profession. And they break out digital trust in five components, and it's a way to explain how blockchain advances certain digital trust principles. Uh, and so these are the standard set. If you get a SOC report, you have to have a security principles uh, issued on SOC reports, and then there are four optional uh, sets of trust principles. So securities dealing with the protection of information, availability is that you know systems are available when you need them, and confidentiality and privacy deal with, uh, you know, your relationship, the service organization's relationship with its customers. Are they protecting their information, keeping it confidential, keeping it private, as well as, um, and then the final is processing integrity, which we're going to go into in a little more detail, because that's where a focus of blockchain is, is where, you know, the black box of transactions. How is data manipulation being done within a black box for a service organization? So that's kind of sets uh, the groundwork for really the, the next conversation on how trust happens, digital trust happens. So this diagram is kind of my depiction on how trust happens in a more advanced stage. And all of you, I think, if you're participating in the ISO um, assurance end, are participating in what I call is the referential trust model. So in this particular case, the, the uh, criteria uh, accreditation body would be ISO and uh, NPECB as well, where they create trust criteria in the marketplace uh, sets of standards that pull out the different attributes that we just talked about and, and set them as obligations for participants in a network to, to adhere to, to assert that they are in compliance, that they modify their pro procedures and operations and their technological systems and processes and practices in order to to assert that they are in uh, they are in compliance with a set of controls that have been dictated by a governance authority for the benefit of users. So this happens all the time in a variety of different uh, mediums, whether it's in uh, payment card technology or it's in the running of the in, you know the security credentials on the internet or ISO standards and such. Now depending on the nature of risk associated with the assertion of uh, vendors saying that they are in compliance with certain standards, there is an added layer put in by the introduction of auditors sponsored by an audit accreditation body, and PCB can also be considered one of those, that accredit certain auditors for the ability to attest uh, vendors assertions that they are meeting trust criteria. And when they do that, they attest compliance on, on, on formal reports and communicate that for the benefit of users. Okay, So this shouldn't be that 
uh, novel to you, but we're going to apply now all this information into the, uh, the blockchain world, okay? So let's, let's just start off with, for those that haven't been familiar with blockchain, and I assume, you know, the audience, there may be some that have heard the term or, you know, very focused that term around cryptocurrency. And so the technology we're going to talk about is, is the same technology, but it's going to be applied for different purposes. And so, you know, what is a blockchain? So basically, a blockchain is just a database. It's, uh, it's you know, a, uh, a database with records that are cryptographically linked together. So if, if any of you have ever had digital signatures, you'll know that, you know, the digital signature on, on documents can, you'll know if there is alteration with those documents. Uh, if, even if you change one, one bit, it, it will be you know, identified as changed. And so there is that type of uh, immutability, and we'll talk about that in records within a blockchain. Blockchain records are what they are, and you will know that they have been changed. So they, they, blockchain records have a unique property that we haven't seen in other types of uh, database type structures. The other aspect of blockchains is that there is a collaboration uh, and replication of that database among what we call stewards or nodes uh, dispersed within a, a, a network. It could be a, a regional network or it could be even a global network. And there is a consensus protocol, a, a, a set of rules attached to who gets to write new records. In the cryptocurrency world, this has gotten a lot of uh, press because the consensus protocol is proof of work. And proof of work is the calculation of a very uh, complex uh, math equation that uh, is compute intensive uh, for those that want to get the right to issue new records. And that has established some challenges in, uh, for you know, ecological challenges. Uh, around the usage of electricity to just uh, try to try to be the winner of certain records that get uh, produced in certain cryptocurrencies. Now, consensus protocol doesn't have to be proof of work. It can be a variety of other things, uh, other methods that don't have, you know, those that backlash associated with the proof of work. Now, the other uh, unique aspect of blockchains, we can embed uh, a, programs within blockchains to execute uh, using uh, certain rules associated with it. And those contracts, since all records within the database are immutable, can create, um, you know, can create transactions uh, that have strength in the marketplace. And, and this is one of the first technologies since it was, you know, currently used with digital currency. It works with either, you know, it works with a variety of different digital currencies. And there's a number of things stayed up. And we're going to talk a little bit more about kind of the, the uses in digital currency around that. So, so as we relate the, you know, the digital trust attributes that we had before regarding security, you know, privacy, availability, processing intent, integrity and such. There are certain aspects of blockchain networks that advance this that, that no other type of technology has done before. So because records cannot be changed or you'd know if they were changed, it creates a clear sense of value within the marketplace. So Don Tapscott had mentioned in his presentation at the Hyperledger conference that I went to at the beginning of this month said that I, that blockchain can change the internet from the internet of information to the internet of value. So it creates opportunity where there is sor one source of truth that we have confidence about. And the immutability and non-repudiation -rep of records really adds to the processing 
uh, integrity of trust that I had mentioned before, more so than any other technology that I have seen in my career. It also creates some uh, novel variations of privacy called near zero knowledge proof, where there are data, there's data records that uh, don't have to be disclosed, but you have confidence on certain attributes of the data records, such as if my data record shows that I am over 21, or let's say I'm 25 years old, I can prove that I'm over 21, but not having to disclose my actual age. And there are really excellent novel opportunities because of that, that attribute within uh, blockchain networks that we can advance forward. Now, certainly when we have uh, nodes uh, replicating the database across the internet, it creates redundancy and greater availability for systems. So we will then, if this can pr promote the opportunity where data can be absolutely anywhere and available if it's supported by the networking that networking advances that we're seeing. And we'll tie that in uh, later in the end of this presentation to show how this technology, because of its, because of its attributes here and the advances of technology in infrastructure, can really propel the internet significantly. So I'm gonna, you know, so our focus, at least my, my focus has been around uh, the Linux Foundation's use of um, blockchain technology. And the Linux Foundation created a, an organization called Hyperledger that uh, similar to other Linux Foundation op, uh, uh, properties, have created open source for, um, for customers and users to use blockchain technology. And uh, in, uh, you know, these are the various projects that have been developed uh, by the Linux Foundation. And I'm gonna ask uh, Drummond to kind of talk a little bit about some of the ones that we, he has been directly and his associates have been directly involved in. Yeah, the three at the Hyperledger uh, project. So the Linux Foundation is the largest home of open source projects in the world. And I think it, it, it uh, uh, hosts over 250 such projects. Um, one of them called the Hyperledger project is actually an umbrella and it hosts a number of uh, open source uh, projects inside of it. Uh, this is called the Hyperledger Greenhouse. The uh, top layer is what they call frameworks or uh, basically open source software for running a blockchain. And the lower part is called tools for, um, for uh, interacting with the blockchain, building things on top of it. Um, the uh, one specific project at Hyperledger that's devoted to digital identity and trust is called Hyperledger Indy. Um, and that's circled at the top. And then the two tools, uh, that was the first project started there uh, it, that was identity focused. Um, then uh, over at the far right, Hyperledger Ursa was broken off as a, a shared cryptographic library uh, that included, as Scott said, the zero knowledge proof cryptography that Indy brought to the Hyperledger family because it was so useful in the other blockchain projects. And then on the far left, you see um, the third project that was spun out, which is called Hyperledger Ares. And that's uh, the open source technology behind the digital wallets and digital credentials that we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, great. So, you know, I went to the Hyperledger conference in December of 2018, and Ruth I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's kind of a, a very well-known pundit in cybersecurity, and basically stated at the presentation, is the blockchain shifts trust totally into people, in, in institutions to trust in technology. And I think that a lot of people in the audience would kind of be questionable. I, I questioned that because in my uh, experience, um, you cannot take away the human factor in any trust equation. And, um, you know, I, I've seen where the trust breaks down in any technology on, 
especially on the governance side and errors and things that I had talked about earlier in the presentation around human frailty. So, you know, I was kind of puzzled by the fact that they'd say, well, blockchain is going to eliminate people in the trust fabric. So it was interesting to see that uh, shortly thereafter on that uh, presentation, he kind of did a bit of uh, retraction of that. And so he had highlighted that it shifts some of the trust. And I, I do agree. We're going to talk about kind of the stack of blockchain trust. And you'll see that there are components that are driven by cryptographic technology. And, but there always will be uh, emphasis on, uh, on, on human aspects of trust. So, you know, for those who have not really spent much time in the blockchain arena, you know, what is blockchain the panacea for everything? And the answer is no. But for certain technologies and aspects and, and social cooperation, um, blockchain will be a game changer, absolute game changer. And so as, you know, as I had mentioned with Don Tapscott saying the internet of value, we, you know, the blockchain, because of records being immutable, not changeable, they create sources of truth, especially for aspects where ownership is in question. You know, we had a presentation uh, at the in the 2018 Hyperledger conference around diamonds, where the provenance of diamonds, the source of diamonds, you know, are under, you know, there's conflicted nations around who owns certain diamonds, putting records out on a blockchain that cannot be changed can create the source of truth for diamonds and other assets that are absolutely critical to identify the owner and the source. So diamonds, title, assets, other things that create where ownerships uh, may be in question is really uh, you know, targets for a novel use of, of blockchain. Uh, in the supply chain arena, there's a number of block, blockchains being developed by Walmart and by Honeywell re regarding parts and understanding kind of where the source, you know, cradle to grave supply chain. You know, in the United States, we had, uh, you know, we had a romaine lettuce outbreak. And the question exists, where was the source of the problem for tainted uh, romaine lettuce? And it went down to, well, we don't know where the, the tainted lettuce came from, so we're going to block the, you know, the, the sale and use of romaine lettuce across the country. Well, if you had tied a records down to sources right down to, ta to table and, and intermediate steps within, you could identify pockets of, uh, of, of uh, tainted uh, product and and deal with them on a on a on a more isolated basis and that is creating uh tremendous potential value uh in those types of blockchains and we look at you know stored value remember we're looking at internet of value there's a lot of variety of different types of value exchange um that takes place today that can advance with blockchains you know um, mileage programs and and timeshare exchange and creating something that can be more permanent and more trusted uh with the use of blockchains and um in the accounting profession you know we always have looking at double en entry bookkeeping well the opportunity you know within blockchain we can create uh you know one set of books and one that uh, you know, whether it's for you know for financial exchange or or accounting books of record, that's why there's great interest in in the use of blockchain in that industry. But we're going to spend some more time focusing on on a game changer uh, that can be introduced with the use of blockchain technology, and that's advancing what we what the term is self sovereign identity, and I'm sure. Drummond will talk about that particular term, but the advance of making you know physical credentials, digitizing them and using them um, in our in our daily life that can create more trustworthy transactions 
uh, in, in, in what I would consider an, an unsafe uh, internet that we live in today. So I'm gonna pass this on so Drummond can explain a little bit more around the, the self-sovereign identity and how that technology can be advanced with the use of blockchain. And the, the term I'll explain a little bit more in a minute, but um, the basic concept of self-sovereign identity is captured by this picture. We all know how to do identity in the physical world today. We all know how to take our, uh, the credentials we keep in a wallet that we keep in our pocket uh, and, and take it someplace and prove our identity like at an airport so we can uh, get on an airplane. What we don't have is a way to do that digitally um, to, to use credentials every place uh, uh, you know on the internet the way we can do it uh, today um, there are there's very limited examples and um, almost everyone on this call I, I imagine is uh, that has a smartphone has uh, either used or considered using a mobile boarding pass to get onto a plane uh, you get you get it delivered to your smartphone and uh and then they scan a qr code on your on your uh phone to get to, you know for you to get on the plane now just imagine self-sovereign identities ability to have a digital wallet on your devices with digital credentials for anything you need like all the things you have in your wallet today so uh i will now quickly explain well why does this need blockchain um what 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 is the breakthrough that suddenly with blockchain allows us to have those digital credentials Go ahead, Scott. And uh, so this is the a basic model of, 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 of the self-sovereign identity uh, system, the way it works. And uh, I need to explain that before this, the, the identity we have today on the internet is based, it's called account-based identity. And it's either you have an account at every site and every application, you have to create a new one every place, and that's why we all have all the long lists of usernames and passwords that we have or we use some service provider uh, in the middle to go and, and do what's called federated login to a bunch of systems. And anyone that's done login with Google or Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter at a website, you're using federated login. You're using your account at one of those services to log into other places with accounts. Um, the self certain identity model breaks out of that. You don't have accounts now, you have direct connections. You have a connection uh, with any other person or organization or connected thing in your life. You'll have a connection with your digital car, uh, with your digital refrigerator, and uh, with every person in business. And those connections are between two uh, digital agents, one that's on your device and one on, that's on uh, the device of the other party. And the secret to those connections is <coughs> that both of you have digital wallets, with uh, private cryptographic keys and those digital credentials there. Now, why is blockchain suddenly the, 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 the solution to how uh, this all works? Well, that comes down to the use of the blockchain is to uh, uh, store what we call the public keys, the public half of, of public private uh, key cryptography, to put the public key um, behind uh, a credential uh, on a blockchain, and, and the technology there uses a, this new standard I talked about, DIDs, decentralized identifiers, so that any issuer of digital credentials can put their DID on a blockchain and then put it in an issue of the, uh, the, the credential and any verifier can verify that key. So essentially it's, it's, it's decentralizing the public key infrastructure that we use today for the lock in your browser is using uh, uh, PKI. But now we're decentralizing it so anyone anywhere can do this and issue credentials that others can verify. Now, go ahead, Scott, and we'll look at this. Um, this that we're talking about called verifiable credentials is already a W3C standard. It was became a full standard last um, uh, November. And this is what's called the verifiable credential trust triangle. Uh, what you have on the left is the issuer of the credential. Let's say it's the Classic credential is a passport that we all use for travel. The issuer there uh, in the US would be the US government, whatever government around the world and its agencies issues a passport. Um, that uh, in the US now you can get a passport card that you put directly in your wallet. So they would issue that uh, card into the holder's wallet. I'm as a, as a citizen, I'm the holder, I put it in my wallet. 
And then I go to, uh, to an airport and I present that to a verifier who verifies the credential and I'm able to get on a plane. In the digital version of this, as I just explained, the issuer and the verifier both use a, a, a what they generically call a verifiable data registry because technically it doesn't have to be a blockchain, but a blockchain is the best way to, to do that verifiable data registry. And with this, we can do verifiable credentials everywhere. You know, they, they can have a fully decentralized, very powerful cryptographic infrastructure that's rooted on blockchain. Now, Scott, in the next slide, what we'll do is we'll make sure that this is clear. Well, how does this actually operate? Why does this uh, enable this? And uh, there are four steps to this process. The first one, step is that the issuer of any digital credential, like a government or um, uh, if we're talking, uh, you know, uh, credit card credentials or financial credentials, those will come from banks and, you know, the same folks that issue those credentials in your wallet today. If it's an employment ID, it'll come from a company. If it's a student ID, it'll come from uh, a university. Those are the issuers. And again, they, to prepare to, to, to issue these credentials, they write um, that decentralized identifier and a public key to a blockchain, they generate it in their own wallet. So this is totally decentralized. It's not like the domain name system where you have to go get a domain name someplace. You generate the credential, you write it, I mean, the uh, identifier and key, you write it the blockchain. That's step one. Now in step two, they produce the credential and now they can digitally sign it with the private key that they have in their own wallet they never share. That credential goes into the wallet now of the, of the holder of that credential and then they can now prove things about that credential. That's what Scott talked about, the digitally verifiable, um, I mean, the, the zero knowledge cryptography using proofs. So if I have a credential, for instance, a passport or driver's license, I can prove I'm over 21 without revealing any other data from that. Now to, to verify that proof, the verifier does step three that Scott shows there of, they. Th that proof will include the DID from the issuer and the verifier will go and, and, and read the public key from the blockchain and then they can do step four, which is to verify that proof is cryptographically valid. It can only come from that issuer and it's bound to that holder cryptographically as well. So, so only that holder can make that proof um, uh, of that credential. Uh, so this is the basic um, uh, trust triangle. And the most important fact about it there, Scott was just revealing that, um, first is totally decentralized. And secondly, in this model, verifiers do not need any integration with issuers. Any verifier in the world could accept any digital credential from any issuer that puts the public key on a blockchain. So you, you can have things like passports that anyone can verify came from a real government. Um, or, or um, uh, employment ID cards or health insurance cards that, that can be verified, not just in the state or county or country in which they're issued, but worldwide. Um, this is a revolutionary digital identity model and it's all rooted in the capability of blockchain. So I, I think I'm done with the slide here, Scott. Okay, so as we look at you know the earlier referential trust model and we add the blockchain in it with the credential registry, we can advance um, the, the assertions and, and strength of, of, of any credential that gets issued. For example, you know, your PECB credential that you get for, you know, for ISO 27001, you can put that in your digital wallet and assert it and PECB kind of established a DID on the credential registry. So when someone wants to verify it, they will know that it bona fide came from PECB. And so, so those are aspects that can add value to that, that referential trust model. Now, in order to, um, to audit uh, blockchain networks and hold individual participants accountable, we'll need to create a trust framework within uh, the network, you know, what are the, what's the governance authority of the blockchain network? What are they expecting trust anchors, anchors and participants, issuers and verifiers to do in order to make sure that they are accountable for the, the practices that the governance authority wants. So we can fit this referential trust model into the blockchain framework. And so I have, 
you know, been working with, for example, the sovereign uh, governance framework and attaching a trust assurance framework attached to it. And that trust assurance framework is basically this purple box in here. And, and it identifies what are we holding individual uh, actors accountable uh, within the process, okay? So uh, certainly we can advance this technology and we're looking to do that and adding more trust even in the referential trust model by the use of blockchain. So as Drummond had mentioned, you know, we're, we're, we're creating opportunities where the communication payload includes trustworthy information. Now, going back to the internet, you know, when T TCP IP was developed, it doesn't have a security payload attached to it. And so uh, with this technology, we can add uh, you know, verifiable credentials and trustworthy information such as DIDs within the communication payload to create a, what we call a trust over IP stack. Now, similar to TCP IP where they have a variety of different components that make up the stack depending on the layers, there are, there are a variety of different layers attached to a blockchain network. We have the lower layer dealing with just managing the blockchain ledger. And we have then the communication protocol within the handsets of the, 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 the actors that are communicating with private keys and, and accessing public keys from, from the ledger. We also had introduced, you know, the aspects in layer three, the credential exchange, where we have trust anchors such as the issuer and the verifier. And on top, we have the human trust that is deriving kind of the rules attached to the transactions needed in this infrastructure. And so all of these aspects re require governance in certain ways, manual human oversight to ensure accountability in the network. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna go through my interpretation of blockchain trust layers uh, that would create what, what was in the purple box of the trust criteria. So there's, you know, aspects of the human centric um, aspects of, of blockchain and the system or cryptographic centric aspects of rules and uh, trust attributes that need to be built into uh, blockchain networks. And so at the ledger level, there are a number of uh, aspects, policies, procedures, agreements, and, and actions that happen by uh, participants at that layer. So you know, especially in what we'd call a permissioned uh, blockchain environment where you need to be uh, you need to have a signed agreement in order to participate, have a copy of the blockchain le le ledger itself. You, you need to have certain attributes. You need to be a viable business. You need to have compute power. You need to have good network availability and such. You need to use a consistent blockchain code associated with it. And so there are rules and governance associated with just how are we going to get all of the participants in a blockchain network to cooperate uh, as one in an accountable uh, network. And if we're going to make a, uh, a decision to actually make changes or put a fork in what they call a fork in, in the blockchain, that needs to be uh, a last resort and a coordinated um, opportunity that's governed by that, by that aspect of the, that layer of the blockchain. So similar to other types of database management structures, we, you know, there are rules associated with who gets to read and, and, and write and how is that done. There's a unique aspect in blockchain because, write, because data cannot be, you know, um, cannot be altered. But there is an aspect to shield access uh, for certain records called tombstones, and there needs to be rules associated with how that gets implemented and used. 
plus the introduction of smart contracts and how that would be accepted on, on, blockchain, on, on blockchain networks, as well as the use of token management. So for, you know, in addition, we need to talk about users. There are people that are administering it, uh, the blockchain networks, and there are users that want to get access to it. What rights would they have? Are we going to have a permission system where it's controlled by at least of who can get access and oversight uh, attached to it? Or are we dealing with a public permissionless system like Bitcoin, which anybody with just the code can add transactions to a blockchain? So we need processes and policies around how you provide access and how you take them away. Finally, in the key aspect that Drummond and I have been working on is how do you manage uh, you know, these networks? They require governance. They, you know, the aspects of how you're going to keep uh, in, you know, individual players accountable depend on a risk assessment. I mean, you may need auditors for high value transactions, but if you have a network that don't require that, uh, maybe you don't need that level of, of, of oversight and attestation. But pretty much all of them will need at least some policies, procedures, and trust principles that, that purple box to be created. And there needs to be some voting protocol because we're dealing with a, a decentralized uh, organization of participants and they need to have agreement on certain key aspects of governance. And, and, and there needs to be jurisdictional issues associated with how do you operate in different aspects of the world and how do you protect um, you know, against um, malfeasance or issues associated with its performance. So I, I did want to get at least a quick comparison to kind of the time that we're living in today against the time that I was operating as, a, as an IT auditor at, at Microsoft and where they were kind of bantering around the, whether they wanted to endorse the, the internet or not. And I, I don't know the age bracket associated with all of our audience, but uh, I'm old. I've been around a little bit. But history repeats itself. And so in, in a global advance of technology, you kind of look at um, major players that, that kind of take a step forward and lead the way. Some don't, don't make it, the, uh, the MySpaces and the Betamaxes of the world, but they certainly take uh, you know, a major role into moving forward on the technology for the benefit of all that follow. And so there is that aspect. And if you all remember, or some of you remember about America Online, Prodigy, CompuServe, Earthlink. I mean, there are versioning networks that are out there, Sovereign, the Corda Foundation, uh, and obviously Bitcoin had, had taken quite a bit of a leadership in that end. But in order to move forward on technology in, in a, a specific link, a uh, leap, we need communication to move forward in, in a viable way. And back in the internet day, putting uh, access to the home created, basically it created the internet. A lot more users, everyone having more personal use of how do you communicate with each other and, and do digital life transactions. The advent of 5G and fiber optics around the world will communicate Will, ad, will advance the technology to allow this technology to thrive. And then where is the view? So without, without the browsers, we wouldn't have a view to the internet. And so the browsers, the World Wide Web, the, the search engines and such created our view of the internet. Well, as we have talked about in this presentation, it looks like the, you know, the smartphone can be an absolute, uh, advancement in the vehicle that would be able to uh, connect with blockchains around the world uh, because of their unique componentry and the fact that it is uh, being used by a large percentage of, of, of people. And so we also need a new communication protocol. TCP IP was valuable for its time. It allowed and it has advanced for the last 20 years, but it doesn't have the security payload 
that's needed for the, the in the age of the blockchain. And so we need to create a, a, a overlay of TCP IP called trust over IP. So we have about six minutes um, and I'm going to uh, uh, pass it on to Ardian who's uh, facilitating any questions that you may have. Thank you, Scott and Drummond, for this insightful and very informative webinar session. I want to inform the audience that PCB is currently working on a detail-oriented blockchain training and that we will inform you for its availability very soon. Now, uh, since uh, we have only five minutes left, I guess we can answer two to three questions regarding today's session. The first question for today is, uh, what are the main industries that have strongly embraced blockchain so far? Well, I mean, you know, I talked about the fact that, uh, you know, the supply chain is leading the way um, because there's tangible benefits associated with really knowing the origin of transactions. So um, Walmart has created uh, you know, kind of ground to table uh, blockchain records and uh, Honeywell has created a, uh, a blockchain for used uh, airplane parts, uh, you know, digitizing kind of individual part records so that you have bonus. I don't know if you know, when you fly today, you're using a, a, you know, a number of used parts and, uh, and people want, uh, you know, the value and, and trustworthiness that the, the parts have, have the right provenance. So, um, Certainly, we're advancing, and there's a lot of advance in the in the digital identity world associated with it. Um, I have been very active in the financial world, financial transactions, uh, large um, money transfers like SWIFT and such. They're looking at blockchain to uh, reduce the time needed for uh, you know for network uh, transactions of fi of financial value. So those have been the leading aspects, uh, and they've really been exercising the technology. Thank you, Scott. Now another more of a technical question. So how is storage managed in blockchain, not noticing that the chain keeps on growing? So if you can just go over it briefly. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. I want to make sure I understand the question. So, is the the concern uh, how how is storage managed because the chain keeps growing? Correct. Yes, yes, correct. All right. So, the the very first thing to explain there is there are dramatically different uh, different designs for blockchains. Um, the Bitcoin blockchain, the transactions are small, but every uh, every node of that blockchain that's that's running it needs to have a full copy of the entire chain, so they all have to store. Um, everything and if the transaction volume is high it is adding up it's not that large right now I think it's I think it's only in the gigabyte range uh, I mean uh, excuse me uh, about 100 gigabyte range but it is expected to keep uh, growing however other blockchains uh, that store very very thin records like the sovereign blockchain uh, the, the storage is not that much and uh, storage technology is easily going to keep up with the uh, with the demands and you don't have to store an entire copy of the blockchain uh, on these other uh, call it more modern designs. So storage is really not an issue uh, with with blockchains uh, because again you want to design the blockchain so it's storing the minimum amount of data that you need to verify things and and all and it, as many transactions as possible you want to put off chain. Uh, in, in Bitcoin, uh, they call those lightning transactions. Uh, Ethereum's got its own technology for it. Uh, so that, that's the general solution to storage. Thank you, German. Now another question, and I think with this question we will conclude the presentation. Would you guess that blockchain could be the security solution for most of the IT system areas? Well, uh, you know, I certainly believe that. Uh, and there's need for that because the the current security model doesn't scale and that's a transit so i have a hard digital credential which is needed in the marketplace but right now with the federation model i need to be registered at various places in order to make it happen and that creates a lot of transactions that won't scale at the level that we need it uh, this blockchain technology can 
if we architect it correctly, can scale uh, to the level that we need for everyday transactions and including security and the payload of transmissions. Yeah, that's I, I agree very much with Scott. The way I would put it is the key security problem blockchain can solve is uh, to enable both cryptographic trust and human trust to extend across systems, across domains, in the same way the internet, uh, you know, allowed us to finally exchange data between those systems and, and, and packets and interconnect the world. Uh, as Scott said at the outset, the internet did not include this, the security layer, the, the identity layer that's needed to do that. With blockchain systems, we can now uh, have that, extend that cryptographic trust across systems and and therefore and then with digital credentials that we are are using those uh that the cryptographic infrastructure to sign and verify we can now extend the human trust across those systems again it, provided it has the uh, uh the, the the trust guarantees that can be fully audited as scott's been explaining in this presentation well thank you once again scott and drummond uh, for this great insight on how to build trust in the blockchain technology and i would like also to thank everyone for attending today's webinar i would like also to inform you that this webinar will be recorded and posted on our website along with the slides of the presentation for more information please visit our website www.pecv.com thank you all and have a great day